Good morning from our global headquarters in New York. I'm Manish Cranny alongside Danny Berger. Welcome to the Bloomberg Brief. Let's set the agenda. Securing support, VP Harris gains enough delegates to clinch a Democratic nomination. IPO over Alphabet, cybersecurity startup Wiz rejects Google's $23 billion offer and sticks to a plan to go public. That's as Alphabet is set to kick off big tech earnings alongside Tesla after the market close. Good morning, Manis. Danny, good morning. They just couldn't help themselves, could they? Dip buyers of the world unite. They came in, they gorged on Tesla up by 5%. We give a little bit back this morning on the NASDAQ. Uh, we're counting down to those Tesla numbers along with Alphabet. What is the core search like? What is the advertising revenue like? We're going to vacillate between talking about debts, deficits and cuts uh, from the Fed and politics. Goldman Sachs talked about the deleveraging in the equity market uh, last week. It was almost like the unwinding of the meme stock frenzy of 2021. So leverage has been taken off the table. We're a little bit uneasy. We're a little bit of seasick. We've got politics and, and big tech. But you just couldn't help yourself at diving in there and picking up some ferocious MAG7 buying up by 2.3% yesterday. Uh, yields dropped to 4.23%. Uh, Are we suddenly now going to begin to talk about strength of the U.S. economy, the GDP. Remember the PC, the personal consumption expenditure, the deflator. We're actually going to talk about those numbers a little bit more as the week goes on, as the halo effect around Kamala Harris's presidency uh, bid begins to shift its narrative. Dollar yen, uh, you're just seeing the dollar down, the yen strengthen. Yes, politics is part of that narrative. I know that you covered that last week, Danny. But this strengthening in the yen, it could be that there's a move from the Bank of Japan, also reinvigorates, and another move for intervention. They're starting to talk Talk about that again, the potential for that to come. Danny, good morning. Good morning, Manis. This just coming from our Bloomberg News team that Kamala Harris's presidential campaign has raised a hundred million dollars since Sunday afternoon. So it's been less than 48 hours, and already you see this momentum. You get the sense that maybe some big donors had been holding back, just waiting for the switch yeah. over to happen. But I'm just looking at some of the names here. We talked about Soros yesterday, Evercore founder Roger Altman, Centerview Partners co-founder, and BlackRock co-founder Ralph Schlostein. So there is this real momentum from Wall Street, but of course we don't really necessarily know what her policy will look shape, what will shape like, especially when it comes to M and A. Will she want Lena Khan still as the FTC chair? Well, this is where we're going to begin to understand the halo effect of having got the 1,976 delegates to technically get her over the top. So that nomination looks as if it's secured. So she has that, but now we need to understand where is she on, as you say, regulation? Where is she on foreign policy? Where is she on tax? And um, what are the things that she will be able to go head to head with Trump on? Now you talk about sort of the, the capital donors. I've gone for something slightly more <laughs> glitzy. I mean, you have. We've been chuckling. We've both been chuckling uh, about Charlie XCX. And of course, you should, we were looking at the tweet, the, the Twitter banner for Kamala Harris. <laughs> this is about Kamala is brat. Danny has literally, this has been 24 hours of, of Kamala is brat with Danny. But it's also about the rest of Hollywood coming out behind Kamala Harris. And they've been reasonably recalcitrant when it comes to Biden. Still waiting for George Clooney to give his opinion. He hasn't yet after he wrote that op-ed. But Barbara Streisand is back Kamala Harris. So obviously, it's all over. Yeah, but then, of course, where is, you know, where is, uh, not Barbara, where is, uh, <laughs> it'll come to you, man. It'll, it'll come, come to me. Where's the, re where's the rest of Hollywood? You've where got Ariana Grande, Cardi B, uh, and John Legrand. Yeah, there you go. Okay. John Let's, Legend. Yes. Got perfect. it right in the end. You've, you've got pop culture down, man. It's there all good. Go. Okay. Well, Kamala Harris did speak yesterday. Let's take a listen to that. So, in the days and weeks ahead, I, together with you, will do everything in my power to unite our Democratic Party, to unite our nation, and to win this election. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, called out Democrats for shifting to Harris. Democrats are the ones who want to throw out 14 million ballots and not elect Kamala Harris, but select Kamala Harris. With a bunch of billionaires and Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi making the decision instead of Democrat voters, it's disgraceful. And that's the threat to American democracy. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Vonnie Quinn, who's in Washington. Vonnie, there we go. Kamala is over the threshold now to get the delegates. What kind of momentum now is behind her? Huge, Danny. You just read out the numbers there from the Harris campaign. $100 million between Sunday afternoon and Monday evening. More than 1.1 million unique donors and nearly two-thirds of those were first-time contributors. So that is a real 
feather in the cap for the Harris campaign. It's actually the Kamala campaign. She rebranded Biden headquarters. And if you noticed there in the video, it's the Kamala campaign at this point. She's going to need that money, though, and she's going to need the money from all of the donors that you mentioned and Abigail Disney, another one back in the fold. The super PAC allied to Biden, Future Forward, had said also that it received $150 million worth of new pledges from donors who hadn't previously committed to supporting Biden or who had paused giving. So it's a massive, massive effort, and it's a united Democratic front at this point. Not only do you have her over the limit and the presumptive nominee now, but you have all this money coming in. She's going to need it. She starts campaigning in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a swing state tomorrow, in fact. And we already got a glimpse of what the type of thing she's going to say on the campaign trail is. She's going to have to fight back against some of those claims that J.D. Vance was making just there in the video. The Trump campaign tying her to the less popular outcomes of Biden's agenda and saying also that she lied about Biden's mental capacity to serve as president and so on. That's going to be a theme at the beginning of this campaign trail and Harris will be ready to meet it. She already in her chat to staffers today when she was thanking them, I say today, it was yesterday your time, she already talked about her record as prosecutor, right, as attorney general. That wasn't something necessarily she would have wanted to bring up four years ago. It was a different moment in time. It was a different mood, and liberals didn't particularly want a law and order candidate. But you can be sure she is going to hammer that home beginning tomorrow. Bonnie, good to see you. Look, the money's rolling in. We're, we're moving to this more assured, confident Kamala Harris. She's got the backing of the party. She's got first-time donors flooding in. And I think that's what's interesting here in terms of the $100 million. It, it's coming in from first-time donors as well. But when the halo effect, to a certain extent, dissipates, in other words, the euphoria of having Biden off the ticket uh, and Kamala Harris on the ticket, where will the rubber meet the road on policy? Where will she go head-to-head -head with Trump? We've already heard her address abortion on Instagram. So where will she take the fight to Trump? Well, we got a glimpse of that in the Monday speech as well that she made to staffers, Manus. And I can also suggest that the idea that we only have a few months to go to the election might play in her favor that way because that halo effect might last a little while, right? The Democrats have taken back the narrative, the narrative that had moved towards the Republicans after the assassination attempt. And now the Democrats have that again. They can perhaps rewind a little bit to the t point in time when Donald Trump was actually convicted. And that's what Kamala Harris did today. She talked. Yeah about the fact that she had met, you know, fraudsters, predators and cheaters. And she said that she knew what Donald Trump was. But uh, to your point, policies, she's going to have to start enunciating them. She's going to have to start giving us more detail because voters will want to see what she is standing for. Reproductive rights, you mentioned, but there will be all manner of other things, climate change and much more. OK, well, we'll see uh, where, where the depth and direction of that goes over the coming weeks. Bonnie, thank you very much. Bonnie Quinn, uh, burning the late oil in Washington for us. So investors are now weighing in on elections and how they will play out for markets. Jim Zelensky at Janice Henderson writes this. A clean sweep in the U.S. elections should boost the term premium in treasuries by 20 to 50 basis points as the fiscal largesse becomes intractable. intractable. But the odds of a clean sweep appear to have moved lower from close to 50-50 beforehand. Of course, that is before uh, Biden stepped down and Kamala Harris stepped in. Jim joins Danny and I now. So here we are. We, we, we've moved from this assurity that was galvanizing the bond markets about a clean sweep. So the headwinds to the steepeners grew last week. We had that slight flattening. When you look at Kamala Harris stepping into this, it doesn't say to me that suddenly the Democrats are going to be so much more fiscally responsible. So what's the response mechanism, the appropriate response mechanism from the bond market? Jim, good morning. Good morning, Manis. Um, look, I think the short answer is neither party gets awards for being fiscally responsible. Um, and a clean sweep on either side, to me, would be damaging, you know, for different reasons. I think with Trump, clearly the concern would be tax cuts. Um, with Democrats, probably a little bit more geared towards spending. But on either side, we are right at the precipice, I think, of having the debt situation becoming intractable. And I think that's the worry of markets, is you know, gridlock is good. So I think on the thesis that gridlock is good, you know, anything but a clean sweep probably leaves markets in a better position. That's probably what we have priced in. I, I think the clean sweep, though, 
know, could lead to a little bit of loss of kind of logic and reason and, and allow things to get a little bit out of control, at least on the narrative side, and lead to that steeper curve and that fiscal yeah. irresponsibility right. premium that I'm talking about. Jim, I mean, we've seen this abroad of a bond market that's been able to react to certain government spending too much. The UK will forever live as the classic case. What is your yeah. confidence in a bond market that can have that function in the US, that the vigilantes can come in and bully certain policy from the US if we do get a clean sweep and, as you say, the debt situation becomes intractable? It's so difficult to know what the magic number is, and, and I think we saw in the UK markets get very concerned that we had crossed over that um, magic number. The reason it's so difficult is that as long as interest rates don't exceed your growth rate, things like that, as long as the excess savings pool is sufficient to take down all the bonds that are being offered, you don't have to have a crisis. The problem is none of these relationships are linear, right? They're very exponential. And it's only when markets lose confidence that you really see that reaction. I, I think given that we are in a position now you know, with so many of the expenditures being either mandated or interest expense you know, having to be paid, there's just not a lot of control over what remains. And I think for that reason, I think there's a little bit more sensitivity. You know, does this take us over the precipice? You know, I, I'm not sure. I just think the markets have to respond by pricing in a higher risk of that happening. So what trumps what? In the next six months, you're going to have a Fed, which in theory, if inflation goes according to plan and the markets are right, in theory, we should get to rate cuts. That should deliver a response mechanism from the bond market. Or does the bond market responsibly cast itself forward and look at the risk of deficits and debt, which outweigh the rate cuts. It's that ju it's almost like a bifurcated bond market. Six months, the next six months, followed by the following first six months of 2025. Yeah, it's a classic tug of war. I mean, when you look at history, the odds are really quite high that you'll get lower rates, lower long-term rates, once central banks start cutting. The only reason you wouldn't is if inflation somehow reignited. I don't think that's in the cards. And so that's your argument for lower rates. I, I think tariffs, um, uh, you know, the fiscal largesse, those are the arguments for higher rates. I think the lower rate argument wins out. I, I think the slower economy, the really good evidence that we get that inflation is, is coming off the boil really nicely. Um, we see more evidence with commodities coming down. Um, wage pressures you know, look quite well behaved. So that argument remains very strong. And, and so I think that is probably going to win out. Um, it's just a higher risk environment, higher dispersion environment that I think many are giving it credit for. Well, Jim, I know that you think that the markets maybe are getting overexcited about the rate cutting cycle, that yes, something has changed, it is on its way, but maybe we've overdone that. And that gets to a conversation that has been shifting from going when the Fed is gonna cut to buy how much they're going to cut. So do we have enough disinflation in the system that it looks something more like a classic rate cutting cycle or are you just talking about a mid-cycle tweak, just an adjustment? I, I think it's probably more than an adjustment, but you've got to recall here, markets get very impatient. You know, they see weakness, they see disinflation, they want a response. But if you're a central banker, you're probably thinking, hey, this is exactly what we wanted. It's what we were arguing that we needed. And so I think they're going to be patient. I don't think they will feel like they have to rush into things. There's actually less evidence that they have an overly restrictive policy um, than what they might like. So I, I think the torch has been passed, though. Inflation was probably the theme of, of the last two years, clearly. Um, but it no longer is the key theme. Right, you've had that story baked in. Inflation expectations have remained very stable. Central banks, um, markets, everybody's highly confident in that story. As I mentioned, commodities are now coming off. What you don't have is maybe the full story on things like employment, um, the deficit financing, all these other issues that, that probably now take a little bit more precedent. So near term, I would watch employment. You know, can they cut more than once this year? Um, looks like September is highly likely. You know, once you go beyond that, I actually do think they're going to look for a bit more evidence that things like employment are softening. That will give them both arguments to really rest on. 
And so for market expectations to now be exceeded, I think on the easing front, mm -hmm. you probably need a little bit more evidence um, for the Fed to move Jim, and to move quickly. We appreciate your time this morning. Jim Zelensky of Janice Henderson, thank you. Okay, let's get to some of the other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. Poor shares, they are falling by the most on record after the luxury car maker cut its global outlook for the year. The German manufacturer said a shortage of aluminum parts could cause it to stop production of some models. Porsche is also struggling with weak demand from China. Julius Baer has hired Stefan Bollinger as its next CEO. The Goldman Sachs veteran is relatively unknown pick to lead the wealth with Swiss wealth manager as it seeks to move past losses related to European property company Cigna. Bollinger is to start his role no later than February the 1st of next year. Meanwhile, CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz is being called to testify before Congress after the defective software update caused widespread global outages. The company has been asked to promptly schedule a date after that disruption health hit healthcare, airlines, port companies, and governments. Coming up, cybersecurity startup Wiz turns down a massive takeover bid from Google. And later in the show, we're going to be catching up with Amy Wu Silverman, managing director and head of derivative strategy at RBC. Is the rotation still alive or is it over? This is Bloomberg. Cybersecurity startup Wiz has turned down a $23 billion offer from Alphabet. Wiz instead has decided to move forward with plans to IPO. The rejection also comes with Alphabet looking to compete in the competitive cloud services market, so also blow to Alphabet's ambitions. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie, who joins us. Um, Tom, why IPO? It's not like it's exactly the strongest market. Why go for the IPO instead of the sure thing? Yeah, it's a brave move, isn't it, Danny? Turning down 23 billion US dollars from, from Alphabet. Even for that company, of course, that is no small chunk of change. It's sizable. So they've turned it down. The CEO is saying, look, he's humbled by this offer by Alphabet, but they are going to instead pursue their plans for an IPO, get to $1 billion a year in revenue, and get to that public listing. And this was a business that for Alphabet would have been an add-on. They invested about two years ago in Mandian, about $5.4 billion, so a much smaller deal, but that's been really consequential in terms of their cybersecurity offerings. They were hoping in Alphabet that they could integrate Wiz into their cybersecurity offerings to make their cloud unit just that much more compelling for their customers, because that is where analysts see really the most upside for Alphabet going forward but they have to have to look at other options now, maybe organically investing or looking for other acquisitions in that space. Yeah, I just wonder to what extent was, was the concern about, you know, antitrust pushback, something that, that sort of yeah. played into the thinking here. But look, we could talk about that all day. Let's get the meat and potatoes of advertising, online advertising mm -hmm. and core search. Those are the two things that we'll keep an eye on on Alphabet tonight. And also in terms of where are they on climbing that ladder in competition on the cloud? Is that what's going to dominate the response mechanism from Alphabet. Yeah, look, you're absolutely right. It is the ad search engine. That gives us, of course, a gauge in terms of the consumer and retailers and business as well in the U.S., but also the search function in terms of the driver of revenues. That is still one of the most consequential units. And then cloud, as you say. And again, that is the area where analysts think the most upside in the future is going to come from for Alphabet. $10 billion in terms of the size of that unit right now, competing with AWS, of course, of Amazon, competing with Microsoft's Azure. And that ties back to your regulatory point around Wiz yeah. on that point, which is key as well. $83 billion total revenue is what's expected for the second quarter, but the focus will be on to what extent they are integrating AI into their products within the business and then the products they're shifting out to their clients as well. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye on those, Tom, and it's going to be a hard one for them to beat. If you look at Core Search, what, in the first quarter, that was the highest in eight quarters, but we've all been busy and we've doubled down on our busyness searching for politics now. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. Tom McKenzie there. Uh, giving you the preview. We're counting down to Alphabet a little, little bit later on. Warner Brothers keeping a grip on the NBA, the TV rights. Let's talk about the matching bids in just a moment. Context matters from a beautiful New York.
It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Cranny alongside Danny Berger in New York. Time for the front pages. This is what's making the headlines around the world. First up, we have the SEC has approved the first spot Ether ETF starting today. Ether is the world's second largest cryptocurrency with a market cap around 415 billion bucks. Bitcoin ETFs have attracted more than 17 billion in new money since their launch in January. Coming in from the cold, eh? Uh, and next up, speaking of coming in from the cold, they're not being able to get anywhere from the cold. Delta oh. is still struggling to regain their footing after that tech outage on Friday. 800 flights canceled as of Monday afternoon. Basically, the main reason they've struggled so much more than everyone else, Manis, is because their tr crew tracking software went down and all this, so they basically don't know where anyone is. That's reassuring, <laughs> isn't it, between the captains and, and the crew. Now, when it comes to money and sports, we track it quite well. Yeah, Warner Brothers have offered to match Amazon's bid. This is for the NBA TV rights. NBA was on the verge of signing a new $76 billion deal. This was an 11-year deal, Danny, with ESPN and two partners. So this is, this is the value in bringing sports onto your platform. Well, it's so important for Warner Brothers because they have TNT, which broadcasts yeah. all these. And they basically charge three extra bucks a month for TNT. Are you really going to pay that? if you don't get the NBA on it. Mm, look, I mean, you just got to click on your own TV and see how many of these apps have you actually got and how much you're actually paying for. I just clicked on mine yesterday. I'm overpaid and oversubscribed. I'm going to start yeah. watching Inside NBA, you know that? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. I got to learn about American sports. She this keeps is, telling me. This is a whole new man is cranny. Whole new world. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> From our global headquarters in New York, I'm Danny Berger alongside Manus Cranny. Let's set your agenda. Securing support. VP Harris gains enough delegates to clinch a Democratic nomination. The campaign says it raised more than 100 million bucks since Sunday. IPO over Alphabet. Cybersecurity startup Wiz rejects Google's $23 billion offer and sticks to a plan to go public. That's as Alphabet is set to kick off the big tech earnings alongside Tesla after the market close. Well, congratulations, everyone. You maybe survived the rotation panic because here we are yesterday, big cap tech leading the way. The MAG7 by far outperforms. Maybe today we go back to normal. The Russell 2000 is up a quarter of 1% while the S&P and the NASDAQ falls. I mean, we have been running away to the comfortable parts of this market, but maybe it had to do with the hedge funds. Goldman says that hedge funds had the biggest deleveraging last week since 2021, but now we gear up for earnings. We're a third of this market reports. Your U.S. 10-year yield down by two basis points this morning. 423 is where we stand. And Manis, you pointed this out this morning, too, that the yen is gaining again versus the dollar. We're kind of in this weird, quiet summer lull. Not a lot of news necessarily moving this. We do have a BOJ next week, but for now it's politics that has been capturing the attention the market. It's interesting. You begin to see notes come out now and talk about what's the next trigger to intervention. How we've ended up on intervention as opposed to politics. I don't know, but let's go with the flow. Yeah. But, but you're right. So on Euro Yen, Citi's saying if Euro Yen hits 180, you're going to see intervention. It's more as whether the next Bank of Japan, yes, there is macroeconomic policy as well, whether that is a live event. And when it comes to the earnings, we're going to get Tesla and we're going to get Alphabet. But if you look at the profit expectations, they're expected to grow by just under 30% versus the previous, the past three quarters where we've grown by around 44 to 49%. So the bar is, I don't know, is the, is the bar it's, low or you know, is the bar? It's such a weird thing because it's lower, but still really high. But man, this is exactly what yeah. people have pointed to about the everything else rally, that you're in this situation where the big cap tech growth is slowing from a really high base gotcha. and the rest of this market is picking up from a really low base. So they're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. And people point to that saying, maybe this is why everything else can do better, because they're playing this game of catch up. And then you have a look at what happened yesterday. I mean, our headline was, you know, dip buyers of the world. The ferocity of the dip buyers came in. You know, if you see Nvidia down 9% last week, is that, I mean, technically, you're almost kissing a correction. So. Is that enough of a thesis to actually step in and buy that? And Tesla's had such a blasting run. People are saying it's trading like a, like a meme stock. <laughs> well, this is the argument that fundamentals haven't changed, but they might change in earnings season. The proof needs to be in the pudding. Well, politics has caused a lot of consternation, but it does it dislocate your investment thesis. We'll talk about that in just a moment. The Vice President Kamala Harris, you can see her there. Uh, on the presidential campaign now, isn't she? She's raised more than 100 million bucks between Sunday afternoon and Monday evening. Harris has enough delegates to clinch her party's nomination for president. She spoke at the campaign staffers event in Wilmington, Delaware last night. So in the days and weeks ahead, I, together with you, 
will do everything in my power to unite our Democratic Party, to unite our nation, and to win this election. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, called out Democrats for shifting to Harris at a rally in Ohio. Democrats are the ones who want to throw out 14 million ballots and not elect Kamala Harris, but select Kamala Harris. With a bunch of billionaires and Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi making the decision instead of Democrat voters, it's disgraceful. And that's the threat to American democracy. So the gloves clearly come off now in terms of the response mechanism from the other side. Our Bloomberg chief Washington correspondent, Amory Hordern, uh, joins us now around the desk. So she's got the votes technically uh, all in behind Kamala Harris. So the attacks are going to start for us. We were chatting about this this morning, the three of us, which is the halo effect will dissipate slightly after this euphoria. And then we're going to have to understand who is Kamala Harris and where is her strength of policy. So where is it? Well, this is a really big reset for Kamala Harris. She was a senator, she was an attorney general, she was a vice president, but when you're a vice president, you really need to shepherd through a lot of the policies of the individual at the top of the ticket, President Joe Biden. She's going to lean into some of what the Democrats would view as their successes. We saw her do that yesterday when she made this campaign stop in Wilmington. She might want to lean a little bit more. We've seen her into things like the care economy, affordable child care, student yeah. loans, Things like that she has spoken to in the past. The big policy that she is going to shepherd, and she has been shepherding for this administration, and she's been an ardent supporter of, is women's reproductive rights. And this is where the concern is as well in the Trump campaign. And she spoke about it yesterday. She wants to reestablish Roe v. Wade. She's talked about this already. She was the face of it, talking about abortion and re women's reproductive right, women's reproductive health when she was the vice president. Now yes. she's, of course, going to do that as the presumptive nominee. It's interesting because during this, Trump has been relatively quiet in terms of actually going after Kamala Harris. Amory, I know we had the conversation of is by picking J.D. Vance, is he pack picking his attack dog that can actually be the one who goes after the Democrats? How is that shaping up in terms of them campaigning not just for themselves, but actively against Kamala Harris. Well, I would say Trump was restraining himself, but a little after midnight last night, he went to Truth Social and was talking about this ABC debate and thinks it's, um, he wants to move it to Fox, and he, he's been truthing a lot about it, and he called Kamala Harris, I believe, yesterday, dumb as a rock. So he is not stepping back from that attack dog that many thought he would, mm -hmm. um, potentially because the Trump campaign is probably frustrated. They spent a lot of time and money preparing to go after Joe Biden, and now they have a brand new ticket they need to deal with. But that doesn't mean J.D. Biden, uh, J.D. Vance is also not going to be the attack dog. We saw some of that yesterday. He was saying how it was unfortunate, it's unfair. He wanted to debate Kamala Harris, and now that's going to go to the top of his ticket, Donald Trump. Yeah. Be interesting to see uh, who is the VP that could maybe match up against him. Anne Marie, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Anne Marie Hordern, who you can catch in a little over 20 minutes' time on Bloomberg Surveillance. So let's talk about where volatility stands at the moment. Uh, the latest developments have thrown what our next guest calls another volatility pothole. But elsewhere about the market, she writes this. It's Amy Wu Silverman of RBC. Sentiment has shifted from fear of upside to fear of downside. Specifically, investors went from bidding up call options due to FOMO and MOMO to now focusing on the downside risk. And Amy joins us now. Amy, I wonder how this shift also squares with what we've seen over the past two weeks. That is this rally of everything and a lot of junky kind of stocks rallying too. Yeah, that's right. And it's interesting because, you know, my comments that you had read there was really much more related to the MAG-7. You're really seeing that exuberance being sucked out, but it was kind of staying in IWM. The interesting thing is, Danny, whenever we see these, they tend to be short-lived. We haven't seen a sustainable pickup in that call skew, so that right tail exuberance in IWM and the small mid caps. And here we are again, back, back to our old favorites. And I'm quite interested to see if that lasts during earnings season as well. Uh, you, you mentioned some of the fundamentals there, like the earning, the earnings season itself. But politics have been the, the, the alpha of the bond market, perhaps less so with the equity market. The equity market, that great rotation, uh, that thesis of last week was pushed along a lot by rate cuts. Do you think the great rotation, if it is that at all, has, has run out of puff in the near term until you get the rate cuts underway, or do you think it will reassert, reassert itself? 
Look, I think for now it's the former. Uh, when we look at the options landscape in small B caps, so your IWM proxies, you don't see that bit to the upside that you saw even a week ago. And, you know, one of my kind of theories on what happened was, yes, it was a growth rotation, but it was also a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction post the assassination attempt on Trump. When we looked at our Biden basket versus our Trump basket, you saw substantial outperformance in the Trump basket, perhaps saying, you know, he's definitively got the selection locked in. Let's go ahead and start doing the 2016 playbook of his policies. Mm -hmm. Of course, now we have another wrench in the situation with a completely new potential Democratic candidate. And I think markets are reversing a little bit of that trade from last week as well. How do you separate these things, Amy? Because you look at, for example, Goldman Sachs has the statistic out that hedge funds deleveraged the most since 2021 over the past week, and especially these long short portfolios who are probably long big cap tech and then short some of these smaller cap type things. Because when you look at the different pillars, there are different things that could hold this up. How do you try to disaggregate them in understanding the longevity of that type of rally? Yeah, look, this this is by far the trickiest part. I think when you look to sentiment and positioning, that's where you get the best option signal. But look, the hedge funds, of course, are a key component of the market. They are not the entire market. And when we talk to institutions that are not hedge funds, you know, one thing we've talked about for a long time with them is when they will go all in on the trades that expand the breadth of the market. That's been an overwhelming concern for a long time. I don't think we're there yet, but it's something that's been on many asset managers radars. And I do think that that's going to be more coincident uh, with actual rate cuts happening versus sort of pre-trading it. That's something we talk about a lot with our chief equity strategist. It's very interesting. I had lunch with somebody on Sunday and they said, you know, their portfolio is up 25 percent. They're a bit worried. But the guy told them to take off some of their big cap stocks last year and they're still not there. But volatility is going to rise. My response to him was, well, buy yourself some protection. That was a personal view, by the way, not an explicit Bloomberg view. You look at the volatility spikes that you have. 2000, 2011, Brexit, Trump won. Vol is low, but what is going on in the volatility market? Why is it so repressed? Is that people aren't prepared to spend the money on volatility? Or is it they just don't believe uh, that, that you're really going to see an explosion in volatility and that Goldilocks soft landing will prevail, hence vol is repressed? Yeah, it's it's two huge mm -hmm. factors. One is we're sort of in this paddling duck market. And, you know, we just described this as everything looks kind of calm on top, uh, but you don't see that duck violently paddling underneath. That's our rotations, essentially canceling each other out on, a, on an index level for volatility. And the second is that correlation component. You know, when we get these rotations, our implied correlations are quite low. But I think as we talked about earlier, it's, it's almost hit a lower bound. You know, I don't know how much lower we can go and exogenous shocks tend to raise correlation, which thereby feeds into higher volatility. I think we're getting to a point we've seen VIX start to bubble. Uh, and, and I think, you know, you can continue to get that when you look at precedent from historical elections. You know, we've gone as high as 25, 35, uh, even more. And I just think that, you know, we're not quite there in terms of the potholes, but we can be. There's nothing we love more than an exogenous shock at about 4.59 and 55 seconds just before we read the headlines. Amy, thank you very much. Good way to wake up in the morning. It's the only way to wake up in the morning. <laughs> exogenous shock. We're in good form. Amy, good to see you. Always in good form uh, with that land of limbo for volatility waking up. Amy Wu Silverman over at RBC coming up on the show with Danny and myself. Wiz, no thanks. That's the message to Alphabet. The cybersecurity startup says we're off on the IPO road. Take your $23 billion. We've got other things on our agenda right here on Bloomberg. Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Granny alongside Danny Berger in New York. So the cybersecurity company Wiz turns down $23 billion takeover bid from Alphabet. Uh, instead, they're going it alone. The plan is to IPO. Tom McKenzie is with us. So this is mud in your eye to Alphabet, really, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're, mm. this was their opportunity to have a step change in cybersecurity in the cloud. But Wiz... They've got other plans. How assured are those plans, Mr. McKenzie? Good morning. 
Well, they said, look, the offer, this $23 billion, and it is obviously sizable, even for Alphabet, this offer has given them that confidence, the Wiz executives say, to pursue their plans. They say they are humbled by the offer, but they're going to stick with their plans to go for an IPO, to get to a point where they're turning over a billion dollars in revenue per year. And they are obviously very confident in the products and the services they offer. This is a company, as you said, cybersecurity. It taps into those cloud services providers, the likes of AWS, of Amazon, Microsoft, Azure, taps into those data, data centers and those cloud providers and does a scan in terms of the data risks and security risks. And it's clearly seeing a lot of uptake coming through from their customers. They think they can look past this offer and go with the IPO. But you're right, it's going to be a disappointment for Alphabet. They bought Mandiant about two years ago to try and beef up their cybersecurity offerings when it comes to their cloud services part of their business. They were hoping to add Wiz to the mix to really make it very compelling. And now they're going to have to look for other opportunities around that. And look, you pointed out earlier that this is a potential risk as well. It would have been potentially the deal around regulatory scrutiny. So maybe they avoid that. But in terms of wanting to build out their cybersecurity uh, options and services, they're going to have to either look internally or look to potentially another acquisition. The rejection also comes at an awkward time considering that Alphabet executives are have to gonna get on a call with investors and analysts after their earnings today. Tom, when it comes to the earnings, what's the focus for you? It's going to be cloud. I think it's got to be cloud, right? In the first quarter, they saw revenues of about 30% in terms of the increase that came through for, for cloud services. They still are well behind Amazon. They're still well behind Microsoft and the Azure product. But that is the potential growth driver going forward. There's still concern about search and whether that's going to be cannibalized by the likes of OpenAI and perplexity and others in terms of those generative AI models and chatbots that are led on top of them. But so far, it seems search is holding up better than some expected, particularly if they're able to take their AI expertise that they have at Google and layer it on in terms of their advertising prospects and drive up higher margins when it comes to targeted ads. So that's something to look for as well. But it's their AI offerings to their customers as well within cloud that's going to be informative. We're also looking at the advertising sales, because that will give us a gauge as well in terms of the health of, of businesses in, in the US. So That'll be interesting. The stock is up about, what, 30% year to date. They were upgraded by Morgan Stanley early this morning with a higher price target. So we'll see how it all plays out for them. Okay, Tom, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie giving us a little preview of Alphabet earnings. Speaking of earnings, Tesla is set to report uh, after the bell today. Investors looking to hear the company is juggling an increasing number of projects. Joining us is Bloomberg's Craig Trudell, who heads our global auto coverage Craig, it is this push and pull between what Elon Musk wants people to comment, focus on, and that is the promise of AI, the promise of robo-taxis, and just getting affordable models out. In previous earnings, that's been what's important to investors. So what is it this time? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the concern going into the last set of earnings was exactly that, Danny. The, the concern that perhaps Tesla was putting off uh, work on a more affordable EVs in favor of, of going uh, for this sort of moonshot bet on robo taxis. And uh, there, there was interestingly, you know, some, some sort of, you know, very clear effort to put investors at ease there and talk about this idea of, of accelerating uh, new models and, and rather than rolling those out in the second half of next year, uh, potentially maybe even being able to get them into production before the end of this year. Heard virtually nothing about uh, those new models in in the last three months. But what we have heard a ton about is is the robo taxi emphasis. And so, you know, to what extent are they actually you know making progress on those more affordable vehicles uh, that are desperately needed on the on the basis of you know how much uh, you know sales and, and revenue has slowed down for this company, uh, and you know can they deliver on on uh, these robo taxi predictions that you know Musk has been making for a long time and and not made good on. Yeah, well, I mean, that delay, the, the delay on the robo-taxi sort of took us all a little bit aback. Um, look, I know Dan Ives is an uber bull on this stock, and he says, look, most of the price cuts are behind us. The bad news of price cutting is behind us. Now it's about getting to 2 million vehicles, and now it's about getting to some sweet spot in terms of margin. Well, what is it that will take the market there? Because we've had a nice run-up in the stock recently. I know we, you know, again, another bid up yesterday after the dip. But what is it that the market's really going to latch on to? Is it going to be the number and the projections, or the margins? What is it that's going to turn the dial for them? Yeah, I, I think the run-up was uh, started by this, you know, reassurance that we're going to roll out new models. But again, uh, the sort of show there ha has been absent. And 
Uh, I, I do think that, you know, unless this company does freshen up the lineup, you know, the Cybertruck is new, but is a very high priced vehicle, uh, you know, sold and uh, built and sold in low volumes. Uh, it, it's not going to sort of, you know, uh, usher in this new era of, of growth for Tesla the way the Model Y did. Uh, what this company needs is a, is a more affordable EV that's going to drive, you know, revenue growth and sort of tide them over until they're able to, to you know, make some, some progress on these self-driving efforts. Okay, let's see what they deliver this evening. I won't really say anything about uh, Trump. There you go. That's what I'm more sort of curious yeah. about on, on the call. No doubt. That's a good point. <laughs> I'm sure investors would not want him to be focusing on the politics no, on the call. <laughs> we don't want him diverted onto that now that he's got the paycheck. Uh, Craig, thank you very much. Excited to see what those numbers are a little bit later on today. We're also going to get some earnings from the consumer side of the market. Uh, UPS, Coca-Cola, uh, they're going to deliver their numbers. Dasha Afasnavia Afaz uh, joins us now with the expectations. So Coke, they got away with raising prices like Billio earlier in the year. How's the consumer going to react in this earnings season? Dasha. So the consumers kind of had enough, and I think particularly the lower end consumers uh, are really done with price rises and in fact are switching out of branded products, particularly for things like food. Uh, PepsiCo has already reported and um, the CEO, Ramon LaGuarta, um, said a couple of weeks ago uh, that there's clearly uh, a consumer that is challenged in the US um, and they're, they're trading out of particularly food. And it's not true for all consumers, but some consumers, and I think Coke is going to be feeling that as well. Uh, the, this is a result of um, COVID-era stimulus being tapered off over the last year or so. It's also, you know, people just being very fed up and stretched by yeah. uh, high interest rates and high mortgage rates. Um, and and that's, that's what's impacting uh, consumer goods companies. So they're having to look for, they're having to give consumers better value, which of course has an impact on margins. On top of that, UPS has a new CFO. Um, and it's got a new strategy, so I think investors will be looking to that to see whether their margin expansion plans are working. Whereas Coke, as well as the stretched U.S. consumer, it is also looking at China, where there's also been a slowdown. Tasha, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Tasha off of Nasieva. And, yeah, man, it's been really remarkable. It's not just Pepsi. It's not just Domino's, but it's also the airlines. You point out Ryanair also yeah. having an issue. I mean, they're, talk they're talking about seat capacity, talking about prices. You look at the price rise that Coca-Cola managed to put through earlier in this year, and they are monster. What else have we got? What else is on deck? We'll take you through it in just a moment. It's your Bloomberg Brief. Danny Berger and Manish Cranny in New York. Okay, let's get you set up for your trading day on this Tuesday. And it is earnings galore. GM, UPS, Coca-Cola, Lockheed Martin all on deck before the bell. Then we're going to get some eco data. We're going to get U.S. existing home sales at 10 a.m. And then more earnings after the close, specifically Alphabet and Tesla. Some stocks to watch. Stellantis, U.S. regulator, looking into complaints that the engines in Stellantis vehicles uh, stalled the number of vehicles affected. 150,000 semis dragging tech a little bit lower. Danny, you mentioned this. NXP semiconductors fall. Revenue disappoints. Uh, and then we have GM high ahead of earnings before the bell. The results come after posting the company's best quarterly pickup truck sales in three years. I didn't get a pickup truck. You can't drive a pickup truck in New you York You want City. me to watch football here you want me to watch basketball and she's i'll let you go full american but not the pickup how are you going to drive it in new york you're going to crash into everything i can see myself driving up <laughs> drive driving up or down fifth avenue in my pickup truck there we go there's an image for you all right that's it for brief surveillance that's up ahead here on bloomberg <laughs>